Well, there's another connection in the film, a small one, but interesting, to the next film that we should talk about on the Best Picture list, which is Women Talking, directed by Sarah Pauly. And that connection Mm -hmm. is animals. Uh, There are animals in both films which play major roles. And I think it's a sort of relationship that can only really come out of a a rural sort of uh, environment. You know, in mm-hmm. in Banshees, it's it's mostly a donkey that mm-hmm. you know uh, Colin Farrell befriends and and is a catalyst Jenny. for Jenny. That's right. Yes. Who uh, apparently was who is was adorable. Quite uh, quite the actor on the film. They all spoke pretty highly of her in terms of mm. of her acting abilities. <laughs> and then there are two horses in Women Talking yep. that are referenced quite a lot, and and that. Uh, one of the the elderly members of of the group has quite an attachment to, mm-hmm. and in both cases, they they really seem like kind of very genuine sorts of relationships. Uh, that's I, I don't know a kind of a, a a weird transition, but I guess it speaks to how similar in some ways the the social environment is, and also how different they are because while there is a kind of war of attrition going on in banshees between neighbors uh, the the war in women talking is very much one based on on genders it's it's man mm-hmm. versus woman mm-hmm. what did you make of this film this sort of it's we've kind of referenced before how it takes place in this this really isolated community it's it's a super religious community i would almost say a cult that is yeah. located in, in some place, you know, kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we're kind of shocked to find out midway through the film that this is 2010. Yeah. Because I thought it was taking place during kind of like, you know, I thought they were, they were colonists or something like that. And I was kind of shocked to find out that they weren't. So it's, it's obviously a very re- isolated religious community. Uh, the men have been raping the women in the community at night. One of them is caught. Uh, you know, there's the men, uh, the perpetrators are hauled away and, and sent to prison. The men go off to post bail for them. While they're away, the women decide to talk about what to do. And that's most of the film. So uh, what did you mm-hmm. make of this? I mean, if we're talking about Banshees as being a very particular setting, and I like the things that you were saying there, this one, I I did not get a sense of what that setting was, you know, setting Mm. being both place and time. I didn't understand it. And then they played the, the monkeys tune daydream believer. I think it was, Yeah, but it may have been a different artist singing it. I was never quite sure, but we saw a person in the truck who looked very contemporary and I was very confused. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it made me think of, uh, Shyamalan's, you know, the village, where <laughs> right. we realize that this is all happening in contemporary society, basically. Sorry for the spoiler. You, yeah, right. But I, I felt conflicted about this film because on, on one level, it plays out, and, and you know I, I'll, I'll just leap right into this, but it plays out as a Hollywood white woman Me Too fantasy allegory. Mm. All points of view are aired. And this is a good thing, I think, because you've got these different characters who take on these points of view of it feels like everything that's happened on the Internet over the past six, five or six years. Right. But it's done very creatively. It's done by putting these points of view into, again, these what I was assuming at the start was this old rustic situation. But it plays out in a fantastical kind of greatest hits fashion of feminism in the sense of those kind of, it it seems like the screenplay is trying to hit all of these points of view Mm. as if it's pulled from the internet or pulled from the editorial pages of the New York times. Mm -hmm. Now I should say that the film, you know, explicitly has a title card at the beginning of the movie saying that it is a fantasy. It's a work of female imagination. Yeah. But then you've got kind of these, again, the greatest hits kind of thing. There's one cis male character who is filling a role. He is the ally who listens Mm -hmm. and does not have a say. Now, he becomes a little richer as the film goes on. Uh, There's also 
you know, I'm sorry to say, but a, a token transgender, but oddly, he is rendered mute. Yeah. Um, and so some of these things were just a little awkward. And it was all very, again, kind of white women, Hollywood. And a lot of it kind of played a bit on the nose to me, uh, a little too on mm. the nose, even though it was trying to be fantastical and allegorical. That's the criticism. But let me give my feelings on the good of this movie. I think that this movie is going to have lasting effect. I think this is a movie that's going to be talked about. It's going to be studied heavily in film theory and cultural studies, mm -hmm. MA programs for, for decades to come, I think. Mm. All points of view are aired. You know, I said earlier that that was a bit too on the nose, but I also think that there is something good about this because they, I thought the film was very successful at hitting them. Mm. And some of the dialogue, particularly Rooney Mara's character, Ona, is stellar. Like Rooney yes. Mara's lines, some of her lines were very thoughtful, very philosophical, without making it seem pedantic. I was knocked out by her performance, and I thought all the performances were outstanding, and... I liked these different characterizations, these different characters embodying different ideas. I guess you've got Rooney Mara, you know, playing type. You've got Claire Foy playing another kind of type, you know, like if <laughs> if Rooney Mara is the Kierkegaardian kind of character, then, you know, Claire Foy is maybe Karl Marx. And then you've got Jesse Buckley, who is maybe, you know, maybe not a type that I can give a character to, but she's like the fuck these people. Fuck yeah. these men. Yeah, so Jessie Buckley was also in The Lost Daughter, and I was really pulling for her to for her to win for Best Supporting last year. She didn't win. But um, yeah, those are kind of my thoughts. I, I, I almost want to get into a discussion about this film. I don't know how much time we want to give to it, but there's just so much that can be said about this movie. And what what are some of your thoughts? Well, I would disagree with you in some respects. Like, I, I think when the film started out those thoughts kind of entered my mind where this is kind of like very much sort of a, a Hollywood, you know, uh, white uh, feminist perspective. But as I realized what the setting was, I felt like the film had actually very different intentions in some ways. Mm, and I think okay. it was attempting to find a position where a lot of you know, feminist points of view could be aired alongside of uh, maybe contrasting points of view. Um, and I, I felt like it was, it was trying to find a space for the, the kind of dialogue itself. Uh, in, in some ways, it was almost kind of a rejection of like the sort of lived, experienced, embodied sort of point of view where it's like, because of who I am, what I say has meaning as opposed to what I say has meaning. You know, and mm. I feel like it, it was almost trying to get to that point of view. It did it somewhat awkwardly at times. I mean, I totally agree with you that Rooney Mara's dialogue was was uh, oftentimes very poetic and that her performance was great. Mm -hmm. I also really liked that we had these different points of view. We had older generations, younger generations. We had anger, forgiveness. Right. And... There were a lot of, you know, it was, it was a fantastic group of, of actresses that were assembled, too. I mean, you've kind of mentioned them all. Um, uh, Sheila McCarthy is another one who uh, she's, you know, a kind of a, a staple of, of the Canadian acting scene as well, as is uh, Sarah Pauly and, and, you know, mm -hmm. one of Canada's finest directors as well. Um, so I, I think... I guess I, I was a little bit more sympathetic to the film's intentions. At the same time, I mentioned it was kind of awkward at times because I do feel like, yeah, you mentioned the the transgender character. Like I, I didn't feel like that character was given enough depth to really exactly, you know, yeah, justify the inclusion of that storyline. I did find, mm -hmm. you know the particular reasons for the muteness of that character kind of, uh, you know, very heartbreaking. But I, I did kind of feel like it is an odd choice for a film that's based on points of views being aired and debate and discussion for, for this character in particular to have nothing to say. Yeah, and then they had to, sorry to interrupt, but then they no. had to explain 
why she transitioned. Did you notice that? Yes. They had to explain that the incident didn't change her. She was already there. Right. She was already essentially who she was before, but it gave her the impetus to to transition. Yes. And I thought, oh no, please stop explaining things. Yes. You know? Yes, exactly. I, I felt like it's a it's an awkward mix for a film that almost has Malik like yeah, elements to it, which I mean Malik is just kind of a master at, at not explaining, you know, just Exactly. There there's a a, a vastness and, and kind of an unknowability about uh, some of the milieus that he presents and it's mm-hmm. it's an awkward mix to to have that alongside these you know this very awkward exposition as well i would say at times the film kind of the discussions almost started to resemble a bit of a struggle session you know especially with the one male mm-hmm. character where his his main role i mean ostensibly it's to write but really it's kind of just to be a, a whipping post you know for a lot of anger yeah and he's just right. constantly sort of apologizing. And, you know, it's like, yes, I know my place. I shouldn't speak. And it, it, that, to me, didn't feel authentic. You are, you are right. He's given more right. depth throughout the film. But like a lot of films that try to deal with these sorts of subject matter, they, they kind of just leave, I guess, class behind. Because mm. as someone who grew up in around farmers, you know, and around a lot of people who just were manual laborers and fishermen and stuff like that. Like, yes, I, I, I get that you can kind of elevate the way people talk to have these sorts of discussions, but a lot of people see themselves as workers, you know, from this social environment. And yeah, I guess they do kind of explain that this guy left to university and he was kind of rejected by the colony and stuff like that. So he is kind of an outcast. It does kind of make sense for him to to not identify maybe with the other male characters. But I don't know. It it just seems kind of a little too convenient that, the, that you have this one guy who's just this perfect sort of whipping post, just this kind of almost pathetic uh, character at some points, as opposed to someone who's... I guess has a point of view, right? Yeah, he did. He doesn't have a point of view, and he's rendered without a point of view. And again, I think this is part of the fantasy element. Yes, I think it's a fantasy male. Yeah, and if if this is a work of female imagination, it it succeeds in some respects in 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 you know having this dialogue, this discussion play out with so many points of view, and not really having any of them excluded. But at the same time, there there's it kind of points to a lack of imagination in terms of imagining how the adult men and the adult women can actually coexist. You know, the the solution mm-hmm. the film finds is just to leave them all behind and raise the younger boys in such a way that they never repeat the mistakes. Now, again, it's it's a very specific milieu, but if the film is trying to suggest anything beyond this milieu, it does speak to a very profound lack of imagination in terms of seeing how adults can coexist and Mm -hmm. i just to wrap up this point i would say too if you look at a lot of the problems that are you know endemic uh, amongst younger men for example um you know lack of of men being in relationships um a profound sense of nihilism uh a decline in sort of material conditions. These are problems that that require some amount of imagination to, you know, I guess, be talked about and expressed in in art. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good point, too, that a lot of these problems are ones that women are experiencing, too. And Mm -hmm. to have this conversation happen along gender lines rather than, say, generational lines, class lines... Mm -hmm or a mix of the of these sorts of uh, divisions, I don't know, for me, that would make it more relevant. Mm. So I guess there are aspects of the film which are very interesting and aspects which are, I guess, disappointing. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm with you. And this is, this is my conflict with the film. I, I think it handled some aspects exceptionally well. But when we get to the end of the film, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to feel about this. Because again, they did kind of like what you're saying or or what you're if i can extend your thought mm. that the solution is to remove 
themselves from the situation with men. And that decision, if it's meant to be allegorical to our present situation, I don't know what that says. Hmm. I don't know what that message is because it's just very odd. I will have to think about this movie and that's why I think it's going to be discussed for decades. I really do think it is hmm. because it's capturing this moment right now. But I don't know if it left us with a good ethics. Hmm. Very well said. And you are right. It, it is a powerful film despite all of its weaknesses. Yeah. It's a film I didn't I expect watch it to again. be. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Especially for a film that's very much like a play in how yeah, it's, it's like a play. Right. <laughs> so 12 angry women. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, you that's know, rather kind than of 12 angry men. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a very good point. I mean, it's, I don't know. It's, it's a movie I, I, I want to see again as well. 